Hey y'all, it's me, Dr. Sweeter, one guy, no girl. Did you guys know that 70% of women in perimenopause have depressive symptoms? It's very alarming. I have patients that I see daily who complain on a day-to-day -day basis that they just don't feel like themselves or they feel like they're born crazy. And so today I wanna to talk about why that is and whether or not hormone therapy can help and what other factors are involved and what can, we can do about it. So the question is, am I going mad or is this menopause? So let's get at it. Hey y'all, it's me, Dr. Smeena Ramon, Gyno Girl. Welcome back to another episode of Gyno Girl TV. I'm Dr. Sweet Ramon. I am a sex med gynecologist and menopause specialist in downtown Chicago. I'm also licensed in not only in Illinois, but in Indiana, in Wisconsin, in Arizona, in California. So can happily see some of you virtually in those states. And just as another reminder, um, I do have a podcast called Gyno Girl Presents Sex, Drugs, and Hormones, which has been very exciting to do. And a lot of my patients have been on talking about their journeys with sexual medicine issues or menopause issues. And I've had a lot of my expert friends and colleagues on there. So please join us over there. I try to put some clips here sometimes too. So hopefully you guys get some of that as well. But today we are gonna talk about perimenopausal mood disruption. Am I going mad or is this menopause? Let's talk about it. So what I said in the introduction was that about 70% of patients have depressive symptoms related in perimenopause or in the midlife. One in five women between the ages of 40 and 59 get prescribed antidepressants, okay? So it's an issue. It's an issue. There's a lot of reasons for it. And one of them is, yes, the hormones. Let's just talk about how we screen patients for depression. And this is what I use in my office. It's called a PHQ-9. You can guess this here. I'm gonna just review the questions we ask so that you guys can be aware of it, okay? And it's supposed to be over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? And we scale it not at all to nearly every day, okay? So little interest or pleasure in doing things. We call that anhedonia, where like nothing brings you pleasure. Feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Trouble falling asleep or staying asleep or sleeping too much. Feeling tired or having little energy. Poor appetite or overeating. Feeling bad about yourself or that you are a failure or have let you, yourself, or your family down. Trouble concentrating on things, such as reading a newspaper or watching TV, moving or speaking so slowly that other people have noticed, or the opposite, you're so fidgety or restless you have been moving around a lot more than usual. Thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself or having suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation. If you checked any of these off as problems, how difficult have these problems made it for you to work, take care of things at home or get along with people? So those are the questions we ask. It's called a PHQ-9. It's a, it's a screening test for depression. Anxiety is another kind of mood disruptor that happens in uh, perimenopause, but we see it a lot in general with patients across the board, especially nowadays. And, and with all that happen that's happening in the world, as well as everything that, you know, when you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's really like when you have, you know, um, hiccup, I, I call them brain hiccups. So you have like a ruminating thought that you can't turn down in your head. And a lot of times it's like, you know, uh, oh, is something going to happen to X, Y, or Z? Or, you know, I'm not going to get this promotion. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. So it's a thought that keeps ruminating in your head that you can't turn down. And sometimes this anxiety and these thoughts around it, it makes you anxious. You have bodily response to it. You might have palpitations or increased heart rate. You might get shorter breath and you might actually develop a panic attack. I can tell you that I've never been someone who struggles with anxiety in the past. Maybe just the usual, like a little anxiety for a test or whatever but nothing that really debilitated me in any capacity until I started having perimenopausal symptoms this year. I have difficulty getting on a plane now without getting anxious, but the biggest thing is I actually had a full blown almost panic attack in the car one day. Came out of nowhere for no reason, just started crying, heart racing, felt short of breath, like really it was, had a lot of chest pain. Then I thought I was having a I mean, it was pretty bad. And it was one of these things where I was like, I would have never expected this to happen to me, but it does. And it's part of, you know, the hormonal changes that are happening as well as the psychosocial stuff that's going on. As a side note, 
There was a study that was conducted in the menopause journal, it came out in May 2024, and I did a, um, a reel on it. It it asked women how much they were not feeling like themselves. NFLM, that's what they called it. It was an observations from Women Living Better survey. And basically, 63% of the participants stated that over 50% of the time in the last three months, they were not feeling like themselves. And these were all perimenopausal patients, and it was a very significant symptom. And a lot of the symptoms that correlated with not feeling like themselves were fatigue, feeling overwhelmed or hard to cope with things, low feelings, anxiety, feeling nervous all the time, um, difficulty concentrating, brain fog, not able to make decisions, like you're just pondering too much on, you know, what's going on, not able to calm down, like just crying out of nowhere, feeling forgetful, tearful, crying, worrying. I mean, there's so many patients that I see all the time that are just like, I was in the middle of a huge presentation and I forgot my words. And the whole group of men that I was presenting to or whoever else it was, just looked at me like I didn't know what I was doing. And this affects their quality of life, it affects their job. We know that, you know, women are leaving the, the workforce in their life because of this. I think there was a study in the UK that showed like one in five women leave the workforce, you know, in the midlife and we think it's related to perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms. So you definitely, we have this issue happening, right? And so, you know, from a biologic perspective, Remember I had talked about how estrogen receptors are from head to toe, right? We have estrogen receptors in our brain. We have this estrogen in our brain helps to regulate neurotransmitters, which are control our mood, right? Dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. And without a steady amount of estrogen or too much flux in the estrogen, it causes a change in the milieu in your brain. And all of a sudden you have all of these big symptoms that, that occur. So it's very traumatic for most patients. Like I said, 70%. 70% of patients in perimenopause have depressive symptoms. Okay, so it's not a small amount. And so yes, there's definitely a biologic plausibility when it comes to this, so we know that that's a big factor. We also know that there's a lot of psychosocial stuff happening in midlife, right? I just said, sometimes you're at the pinnacle of your career, you're trying to get to the next level, you get passed up for a promotion makes you very sad. Some people wrap their whole identity around with their reproductive cycle. So all of a sudden they realize, oh, I'm not going to have this reproductive potential anymore. And so some people are just kind of devastated by it. Others embrace it fully. No more menstrual cups. I can go to temple or pray or the mosque whenever I want. Like, so there's a lot of, you know, changes that happen and some people are able to embrace it and other people are not. So these changes in, um, in perimenopause can happen and some people are able to embrace them and some people are not. So there's that idea of what's happening. There's a lack of sleep, right? 70% of women also experience vasomotor symptoms. The hot flashes, the night sweats, it gets you up in the middle of the night. I gotta get up and pee and you can't fall back asleep. And guess what? Insomnia and sleeplessness is highly linked to mood disorder. I can tell you, I used to be an OB hospitalist in my last lifetime, and there were de there were definitely days that I didn't sleep at night, and my mood was totally disrupted, became the most irritable individual, and my personality changed over time. And this is the reality for anyone who's not getting consistent sleep. So don't beat yourself up over that. Then what else happens in midlife other than these changes? You know, some people lose spouses. Some people's spouses cheat. Some people cheat on their spouses. There's a lot of potential disruption that happens in that period of time from a psychosocial perspective, right? There are people who are in the sandwich generation. I am one of those. You might have like a, a group of uh, some kids that you are raising. I have a five-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 14-year-old. And you might also have in-laws, older parents that you're helping navigate their health care or taking care of them. So you got two things happening. You're in the sandwich generation. You're getting pulled around a lot. As women, we take on a lot of burden on our shoulders, right? We try to take care of everyone, but then we don't take care of ourselves. And so that's a crucial thing too when it comes to the psychosocial changes that happen. And with all of this, with all of this not sleeping, with all of this new vasomotor symptoms, maybe you have more joint pain, you're waking up more uncomfortable, you can't exercise. All of a sudden you get, get have that 10 pound weight gain and you're like, this is not me, this is not who I am. And all of that combined with this hormonal dysregulation 
causes people to have a lot of mental distress. There are patients who are definitely the patients that are more prone to this are the ones that have had previous histories and bouts with depression, anxiety, right? Patients that go through early menopause, remember average age is 51. They're patients that have it early or prematurely that are less than age 45. There are patients that have primary ovarian insufficiency. Remember I talked about that in that one um, video and it really disrupts their whole life. All of a sudden they have to deal with the fact that, you know, they may or may not be able to childbear, but maybe they never wanted to, but maybe now they're gonna have all these issues with their bone and heart and all these other health problems. So, you know, there's all these things that happen and earl the earlier you go through perimenopause and menopause, the more likely you are to have mood dis disorders and depressive symptoms. And then, so there's those issues. And then we talked about 70% of women having vasomotor symptoms, and those patients are more likely to have cognitive distress as well as mood disorders. You can imagine if you're having hot flashes and night sweats, it can be very disrupted to how you feel about yourself and in general, okay? So all of these factors together is like a perfect shit storm of like your brain feeling like you're going crazy. But there is hope. I will say that, like I said, one in five women in this age category get antidepressants and most of them get antidepressants before they'll get hormone therapy. And there are these patients who, this is the first time they've ever had anxiety or going through these early changes where menopausal hormone therapy, particularly the estradiol, is very important and can help regulate your mood. And usually you see results within the first month or two of starting it. If months go by and you have no significant change in how you feel, then you need additional support, that it's not enough just to take menopausal hormone therapy. Mainly it's the estradiol comport component. Remember, we can do a patch, we can do a pill, we can do a gel, we can do a ring. We talk about the systemic estrogen in other videos here, but the progesterone can sometimes be a little tricky. We did talk about in my other videos that some people have a progesterone sensitivity, which makes their mood worse, which makes them bloat more. And so those are the patients where we might try something else or try to take progesterone differently if you have an intact uterus. If you've had a hysterectomy, then you do not need progesterone for the benefit of protecting your uterus. Actually, patients that have had surgical menopause or you know other forms of medical menopause that go through it very quickly also have worsening depressive symptoms. Take that into consideration. Those patients can do really well with estradiol and sometimes the progesterone can be helpful and sometimes it cannot Do we have to work around some of that. If months have gone by, or if you have a previous history or a major depressive event, it's possible that menopausal hormone therapy isn't gonna help you like it would other patients. So that is when you had months of menopausal hormone therapy, no mood has changed. We might then try SSRIs, which are the serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SNRIs. So, you know, you're talking about the major antidepressant medications that are out in the market. We try some of those. Some of those help hot flashes too. Some of them, you know, can be very beneficial, especially if you're not able to get relief with menopausal hormone therapy, which about 80% of the time, and one of the studies showed that estradiol will help in about 80% of the time. So in some, I think it was another study that showed about 60%. So, you know, in these patients, we can get some benefit. However, I will say there are lifestyle modifications that you can do to help overall, right? We know getting that good night's sleep, whatever way you can do it, if it's, you know, with that micro oral micronized progesterone that gets you really sleepy and makes you feel good at night, that might be helpful. If you are not able to shut it down at night, you know, meditation, yoga, all of these things can be very helpful for patients to try to get them to sleep. So getting that nice continuous sleep is beneficial. Doing exercise, high intensity workouts, you know, are also seem to be beneficial. So doing some lifestyle modifications, incorporating meditation, incorporating yoga, some of that stuff is very beneficial for uh, improving your mood. Also, cognitive behavioral therapy with a therapist, sometimes along with either your antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication, sometimes separate from that, can be very beneficial. So there are things that you can do to improve their quality of life, I will say that if you start having suicidal ideations, developing a plan, homicidal ideations, any of that, then we can link in this information for uh, getting help immediately because that is something that you need to do immediately. There are also patients that have a history of like delusions and, you know, schizo schizophrenic type symptoms. 
which can get worse in perimenopause and menopause. But actually, Dr. Lisa Moscone just published in Nature magazine how estrogen receptors are actually seen to increase in postmenopause in live women in menopause. And what that shows is instead of having estrogen receptors decrease, which meaning that your body's not trying to utilize all the estrogen it can, it's increasing in perimenopause and postmenopause so that whatever estrogen you have, your body's trying to utilize it. So it's increasing these receptors all over your brain, trying to say like, let's just suck up all the estrogen we can into ourselves and then get it going to regulate what's going on. And this increase in estrogen receptor activity also correlates with mood changes. So this is a huge piece of new information that just came out. And it gives us a window into thinking what we can do. If so many new estrogen receptors, if we give your body estrogen, you know, are we gonna have an improvement of those symptoms? And we've seen that in clinical studies. So I think, you know, the future looks really bright for patients in perimenopause and menopause that we should not feel hopeless, even though you don't feel like yourself, we really can do things to improve your quality of life and whether or not it's changing your lifestyle, it's using, you know, uh, SSRIs or SSNRs. Remember, a lot of SSRIs have sexual side effects that include low libido and orgasm disruption. We talk about that in other videos, but sometimes this complete anhedonia or inability to motivate at all can actually help those sexual symptoms for some patients. Nonetheless, I will say that, you know, there is hope for you. We gotta continue to work on more research and, uh, you know, find someone that can listen to you. If, if you're struggling with your mood, if you're feeling really miserable about yourself, you don't feel like yourself, you want to feel better. I mean, it's not a magic bullet, but it helps a lot of patients, especially in those scenarios I described. New onset, no previous history. And sometimes you need both menopausal hormonal therapy and antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications. And that is okay. You're going through a lot. The changes that are happening to your body are significant. This is a big deal we need to address it as such. Anyway, so that's what I wanna to say to you guys today about mood disruption. You're not going crazy. This is happening for many reasons, including these hormonal shifts, as well as all the stuff that you're dealing with as a woman in midlife. So please have hope, please seek help. You know, go to the menopause.org website, Go to my colleagues that are publishing stuff around this, Dr. Mary Claire Haver, Dr. Lisa Moscone, Dr. Sharon Malone, Dr. Lauren Stryker. Tons of my friends and colleagues are doing a lot of work to try to help women as well as myself. So please don't feel alone and please get the help you need. That's it for today, guys. This is Gyno Girl. I want to talk about uh, not feeling like yourself and you know the mood disruptions in perimenopause. Please join me for my next episode. We'll get into more good stuff and don't suffer alone. Uh, I'm here to educate so you can advocate for yourself. So please get the help you need if you're looking for it or if you're in any of the situations where you're feeling a desperate need to uh, change your quality of life. And you know, we'll see you next time. Please like and subscribe to my channel and hopefully I, you know, you gain a little tidbit of information. Thanks so much.